Hello, welcome everyone. Um, I would like to thank you all for joining us today for this special session uh, of the Animal Welfare Intergroup. Uh, this meeting is uh, organized in partnership with Eurogroup for Animals and the Huma uh, Humane Society International. And before we start with the presentations and the debate, I would uh, um, uh, have, I have some uh, notes for you for some technical uh, issues. Uh, as you might have um, uh, know, uh, in, se uh, in September this year, uh, the parliament adopted a resolution calling on the commission to come up with an action plan to accelerate innovation without the use of animals in research, uh, regulatory testing and education. And I am delighted that we have four experts with us today who will provide us a better insight on the key elements for a successful action plan uh, uh, to transition to non-animal science. Unfortunately, the European Commission uh, declined our invitation uh, to be present today because they are still preparing a reply to the Parliament's resolution. Nevertheless, I am sure that the, today's conversation will have a significant impact on the steps forward to accelerate this transition. Uh, today we have uh, a round table discussion with our uh, panelists, uh, moderated by uh, uh, Dr. Jo Swaid from uh, Humane Society. She is Senior Director Public Affairs at Humane Society International. And Jo will also introduce uh, later our special guest to you. Um, we kindly ask you to write your questions to our panelists in the Q&A box. And to everyone who is following us uh, online, please post your questions on Twitter. Uh, you can do so by tweeting a question and adding the username of the intergroup, that is uh, at AW intergroup. Uh, and we will make a selection and those will come, uh, uh, Joe will come in and post those to our uh, experts. Now, before we start the round table, uh, um, we will see a short introduction on the topic from the two co-organizers of this session. Uh, first, Luisa Bastos. Uh, she is the Animals in Sci Science program leader at Eurogroup for Animals. And secondly, Helder Constantino, who is the director of research policy at Humane Society International. Let's start with Luisa. You have the floor. Thank you, Anya. Uh, let's see if I can share the right screen. I hope you are seeing the slides. Thank you, and uh, and thank you also to the intergroup for holding such such an important session. Why an action plan? Why why are we talking about an action plan to accelerate the transition to non-animal science? Everyone is committed to fully replacing the use of animals in science. Uh, the European Commission mentions this goal in the Directive on the Protection of Animals Used for Scientific Purposes. And after the European Citizens Initiative stopped the dissection, the Commission recognized the opportunity and need for a paradigm shift in the way science is performed and the potential in considering deadlines to phase out animal testing in specific areas. But little has changed until now for animals in laboratories. From 2015 to 2018, there seems um, to be a slight reduction on the number of animals used in scientific procedures in the EU, but no one knows exactly why or if this is a sustainable overall reduction, and it is still a, a very shy reduction. And although the Directive on the Protection of Animals Used in Science includes mechanisms that could, um, if ambitiously implemented, drive considerable reductions of animal experiments, there are, there are considerable gaps that uh, impede significant reductions. It is challenging to gather sufficient expertise within the content authorities. 
there's an unsystematic investment on an animal approaches in many areas. There are lack of reviews on progress in specific areas and lack of EU-defined priority areas. And of course, this legislation does not and cannot in itself uh, provide uh, a plan, a strategy or a roadmap uh, for a scientific transition. And it was in understanding the need for a high level inter-service commission task force to work with member states and all stakeholders in order to put forward sector specific multidisciplinary and synergistic plans that the Intergroup on the Welfare and Conservation of Animals created a working group with the final goal of gathering support for a resolution, calling on the Commission to put forward an effective strategy to transition to an animal science. And this group has met with the experts, stakeholders, and other MEP groups to put forward recommendations for such a strategy that would inform the European Parliament resolution. You can also read conclusions from the from two previous events on similar topics in the links on the on the right, which were very useful to start the conversation. So during this round table, we will try to address the highlights of the resolution adopted in September by the great majority of MEPs and understand how they can be tackled in practice. How can we create the opportunities and where will we face challenges moving forward? And now I will give the floor uh, to Elder and he will give you a glimpse of uh, what will follow. Thank you so much, Luisa. Um, so on the 15th of September this year, the European Parliament adopted uh, the resolution asking for an action plan to accelerate a transition to innovation without the use of animals in research, regulatory, regulatory testing, and education. Um, as Luisa mentioned, the in, in, innovative aspect of this uh, resolution, of this approach, is that it is asking for a proactive strategy from a high-level task force involving all key director general and agencies uh, as a commission in order to, to make progress in terms of reduction animal use and introduction of new technologies. Now, action plans are not new as tools, generally speaking, but it's a new idea in, in the context of animal experiments. Uh, not only that, but in addition, uh, the Parliament makes uh, some proposal as to what could be the contents of this action plan, such as preferential funding under Horizon Europe, uh, broader acceptance of alternative methods by ECA, uh, uh, closely involving the private sector, uh, intensifying training for scientists, and so on and so forth, in order to address the gaps uh, uh, mentioned by Louisa a bit earlier. And the resolution was voted by 667 votes to four, showing the strength uh, of the opinion from the parliament on this issue. Next slide, please. Can you, thanks. Uh, so today's um, discussion will be uh, about trying to imagine what could be the shape and the contents of such uh, an action plan. What should be the role of funding a new technology uh, for these plans? What are the needs of the uh, scientific communities in terms of training? What would be the best regulatory environments uh, for um, non-animal methods to thrive and, and replace uh, animal use? So the objective is not to be too prescriptive, but to give some food for thoughts uh, for people attending this, um, uh, this uh, session. Um, so I would like also to advise that we will not um, touch on the topic of the chemical safety strategy. Uh, unfortunately, animal experiments, it's a very vast uh, topic and um, we, um, we opted to, to make the best of our time and focus on biomedical research and drug discovery. Uh, and to, to, so we can go a little bit more in depth in that and the chemical strategy would uh, uh, and chemical uh, testing in general would probably deserve uh, a separate session of its own. Uh, next slide, please. And this has uh, today's speakers, uh, today's panel who will, uh, will give, give their views, and I will let my colleague Joe uh, introduce them. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Elder. Um, many thanks for the uh, the introduction uh, to to this issue. Um, we have a packed program this afternoon. So, without further ado, let me introduce you to our distinguished panel, who will be giving their views on the necessity of an EU action plan to phase out animal experiments. Our first panelist is Professor Ingrid Fischer in Hamakert who is the chair of the Environmental Governance and Politics Group at Radboud uh, University in the Netherlands. She is joined by uh, Professor Beatrice uh, Silva-Lima, who is a professor of pharmacology and regulatory science, and also the Dean of the Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Lisbon. Our third panelist today is Dr. Kirsty Reed. She is the Director for Science Policy at EFPIA, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industry and Associations. The final panelist for today is Dr. Thibault Bonaguer. He is the CEO and co-founder of NETRI, which is a neuroengineering technology research institute that develops organs on chips. We'll be hearing a bit more about that later. Um, a very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, now that we've got the introductions out the way, uh, let's start the discussion. Um, Please keep your answers short and sweet so that we have time to uh, ask some questions later. Um, I suggest that we now take down the, uh, the, the slide so that the audience can see all of our speakers. Um, and I please invite the speakers only, uh, the panelists only, and the two previous speakers to remain on camera. Thank you. Um, Let's start by diving straight into our subject today, which is the resolution that was recently adopted by the European Parliament, which asked the European Commission to establish a high level um, inter service task force involving all key directorates generals and agencies to work with the member states and relevant stakeholders to draw up an EU wide action plan with the aim of driving the active phase out by reducing, refining and replacing procedures on live animals for scientific and regulatory purposes. The idea of phasing out animals using laboratories isn't new. It's been discussed many times in this intergroup uh, forum. Um, and it's actually already mentioned in the Directive on the Protection of Animals Used for Scientific Purposes. However, this time, European, European Parliament has been asking for a high level action plan to move towards this goal. Um, I'm gonna start by first asking uh, Ingrid um, the first question. Um, you've worked extensively on the concept of transformative governance as a way to address some of the environmental challenges that we're facing. Um, what do you actually make of the Parliament's resolution? Could an action plan actually deliver the transformational changes that the Parliament is actually um, calling for? Yeah, thanks, Joe. And first of all, thanks uh, for the invitation. It's an honor and a great pleasure to be here. Um, and also my sincere compliments on the resolution. It's, uh, it's clear we're not making enough progress towards animal free innovation, so uh, additional action is needed. And I think the resolution includes many elements that uh, can help accelerate the transition. Um, I wanna zoom in on one aspect of the resolution and that's mentioning the links with all policy areas. And, and I think that in order for the resolution to become truly transformative, this is key, uh, especially the link I would say with the Green Deal. So I was uh, able to contribute to the IPAS global assessment uh, several years ago where we talked about transformative change and also uh, defined the concept of tra transformative change as a fundamental system-wide reorganization across not only technological, but also economic and social factors, including in terms of paradigms, goals, and values. So in the report, we actually uh, underline the need to, to focus on the underlying societal causes of sustainability issues and not only the actual physical environmental problems. And such I would say that such transformative change is also needed to phase out animal testing. It's actually redefining or broadening the definition of the concept of reduction in the three R's. 
Because if we transform our economies and society, it will actually lower the need for animal testing. Just a few examples, if we use less chemicals or pesticides, it reduces the need for animal testing. If we have less animal agriculture, we have an less animal disease, hence less uh, need for uh, veterinary medicine. If we move from a curative to a preventative healthcare system, that actually means fewer diseases of affluence and thus also less need for new treatments for those, in essence, preventable illnesses. And finally, uh, and perhaps uh, more fundamentally, or most fundamentally, rethinking the paradigm that all innovation and all developing of new products is per definition good, will avoid animal testing for not necessary new products. So linking with the Green Deal and other policies is crucial, and it's a two-way relationship. In one, on the one hand, all of these sustainability transitions um, uh, the resolution needs these other, other policies to reach its own goal, but also the resolution can actually support making those other sustainability policies more transformative by mainstreaming animal interests into those domains. Thank you very much, Ingrid. That was a, a, a very good response. I was uh, quite curious about you know, the idea of redefining that concept of reduction in the three R's. I'm sure that's probably something that other people are going to uh, um, draw attention to shortly. Um, Kirsty, let me turn to you, since you represent uh, industry, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what the pharmaceutical industry has done in the recent past in terms of reducing animal use? And whether you think some of the lessons learned in this area could be helpful to draft an action plan uh, in the EU is the uh, EFPIA or FPIA, um, not sure how you're supposed to pronounce it, um, and its members uh, pleased with the opportunity of uh, having an EU-wide action plan to promote innovation without animals, or is it something that fills you with trepidation? Thanks, Joe. And it's, it's FP here, but we're not too fussy. But um, I'd like to <laughs> just kick off by uh, thanking yourself and thanking the Inter Group. Thanks to, to Anya Hasenkamp for inviting me to share some of the views of the pharmaceutical sector. And I appreciate your question very much, Joe, as I, I, I don't think many are aware of the extensive activities underway within the pharma sector and also within other, other industry sectors to actively drive down animal numbers. And so let me say, the sector is open and engaging in collaborative efforts to replace, refine, and reduce uh, procedures on live animals for scientific and regulatory purposes. And let me give you more perspective on that. So it is estimated that per year, um, the pharma industry invests about 39 billion in R&D in, in Europe. Okay, so that's um, within the pharma companies per year. And this number has doubled over the past 20 years. So, so while there is a clear increase in the R&D investment, we are seeing within our companies a significant decrease in the number of animals used in our industry. So looking at publicly available pharma company data, so information that's available in the CSR report and on their websites, uh, we can see a steady decrease in the animal numbers per company. And this percentage increase that, that I could uh, identify per numbers um, used in the past 10 years is between a 30 and 70% per company. So furthermore to all this work that we're seeing happening by the individual companies, for the past 10 years, FPA has been showcasing some of the examples of the three R's initiatives and various technologies that are currently in the pharmaceutical research. And we've been publishing reports and our fifth report was in 2019. And here we included a, a non-exhaustive list of about 70 examples of replacement methods, reduction and refinement. And we will be publishing our sixth report in January, 2022. And again, it will show a similar number of new examples. But let me say, certainly we haven't done any of this alone. Everything is in a collaborative um, approach, and this is very essential. And this is something to take into account to answer your question about any action plan. So let me name a few. A few. So FPA and its members are, are part or founding members of the European Partnership for Alternative Approaches. And many of you know um, the EPAA. And this is a unique cross-sectorial um, and multicultural partnership between five European Commission services, 
37 companies and eight industry sector associations. And each, through the successes of the work here, we've seen a number of animals' lives saved. And this structure of the EPAA and the activities, for me, resonates already very closely with the call for action from the parliament and the setting up of the inter-service uh, task force envisaged. Now, quickly, also the Innovative Medicines Initiative. This is the largest um, global health public-private partnership. We've seen 170 projects come through this with a budget of 5.3 billion. And many of these projects have contributed towards improved animal welfare and the uptake of the three Rs. Now, collaborations with um, civil society is very important also. FPA recently teamed up with the Animal Free uh, Safety Assessment Collaboration. Now this is led by HSI. Uh, to organize a virtual workshop on accelerating the global deletion of the abnormal toxicity test. And we would like to see concrete steps forward in the global deletion of this test within the regulatory requirements for human vaccines and biologicals. So to finish off, and sorry to have taken a bit longer to respond here, but advances in science are leading to fewer tests and experiments on animals and to new ways to reduce the impact on the animals. These are based on coordinated uh, efforts and company specific policies within the industry. It is important, we feel, to ensure continued scientific achievements. Uh, however, from our side, we feel that setting generic bans or targets on animal use would have a negative impact on the scientific advancements that we, we've been making. And I also know a lot of work and important successes are underway in other industry sectors. And let's hope that this is a coordinated approach in moving forward. So sorry to have taken a bit over my time, but thank you for the question, Joe. Okay, thank, thank you, Kirsty. It's really good to hear that, that FBO and its members are, are moving in the right direction when it comes to enthusiasm for replacing uh, um, animals' use in, in, uh, in testing. Um, you mentioned targets uh, specifically. The, the uh, resolution actually underlines that the action plan should include ambitious and achievable objectives, reduction targets, and timelines to be set under the overarching reduction and replacement goal. Um, Ichrid, um, what are your views about setting these targets? We've heard some, some concerns from, from, from Kirsty's side. What about setting these targets and uh, timelines to reduce animal experiments? And what can be learned from other environmental policies, for example, I mean, both in terms of success and failure, um, about how to go about uh, creating these achievable objectives? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Joe and uh, Kirsty. Um, this is actually a really important point to uh, reflect on. Um, I think targets have a really important role to uh, uh, enable and also tickle uh, innovation, if you will. Um, um, but we also see time and time again that only setting goals is not enough. You see that in all sustainability issues, whether it's biodiversity or climate change, the sustainable development goals more generally, but also a very specific policies on phasing out subsidies on unsustainable practices, et cetera, et cetera. So setting goals is really important, but never enough. Um, even legally binding agreements often need follow-up action through financial support or through court cases in order to enable um, uh, follow-up action to actually meet those uh, ambitious goals. So this is a really uh, important topic to think about and to think through how to actually enable Im implementing uh, action towards those goals. And I think the action plan can actually um, um, uh, be designed in a smart way that will enable action. So uh, we've recently uh, developed the concept of transformative governance uh, that will actually help us perhaps in, in coming up with a, with a useful action plan. And it's meant to support the governance of the acceleration of transformations and transitions. So, so far, a lot of thinking has gone into what transitions are or transformative change or transformations, but not a lot, and not a lot of thinking has gone into governing such fundamental societal change. And so transformative governance should be focused on these underlying causes of societal problems that I just uh, also mentioned in my, in my first uh, answer. And it should include five governance approaches, um, integrative, inclusive, adaptive, 
transdisciplinary and anticipatory governance, which is a mouthful, and I won't start lecturing, I promise. But perhaps we can um, uh, elaborate a bit uh, in, in later on in the session. So basically what the concept is meant for is to allow public and private actors to together, just like Christy mentioned, to together analyze what mixes of policy instruments and initiatives are necessary to address the underlying causes of a specific problem at a specific point in time. Because, and the action plan could actually use these insights on transformative governance to, to, to design transformative governance approaches for specific applications of animal testing, since it's clear that the problem is different for different applications and also that different solutions are needed over time. So we really need a, a, a reflective, um, adaptive action plan with regular monitoring and tweaking the mix of uh, policy instruments and societal initiatives over time so that we ensure that we remain on track uh, in accelerating the transition over time. Thank you so much for that. I think it's a real shame that the, the European Commission uh, wasn't able to participate in this. I'm very, very curious to hear their views on adapting, um, you know, using such uh, transformative governance approaches. Um, let me uh, turn to our, our, our professor of pharmacology, um, Beatrice. Um, from your experience with translational medicine and regulation, how do you think achievable objectives, reduction targets and timelines could realistically be set out to reduce step by step the use of animals in the development of disease therapies and treatments? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, well, and I have a difficulty with um, this aspect of your question on timelines. Because uh, starting by that, timelines uh, well uh, have been put since uh, I think I have been in these discussions and we are more or less failing all of them because uh, uh, we thought, well, uh, in 10 years, 10, more than 20 years ago, uh, we, we could um, uh, phase out animals and uh, this has not happened. And we are still again asking which are the realistic timelines. And to be honest, I don't know how to answer to that question because I think timelines will have uh, to depend will depend on the strategy that we'll have to put in place to be put in place for this phasing out to happen. And I would add, as a pharmacologist, another aspect which is the need for uh, doing uh, or having such an initiative. This initiative, in my view, is should not be seen only as a kind of a humanitarian need for animal protection. Of course, humanitarian aspects are very important. But the truth is that, that we all know that worldwide, but the European Commission in Europe has had an enormous work and an enormous investment in alternative methods, alternative science-based methods, which have generated a lot of important assets. And what is important now is to take the profit of all this, to try to make better approaches, which will, lead to a change in the paradigm and the change in the paradigm for uh, that is behind animal use and could be replaced or could be replacing another paradigm using all the technological and scientific modernities that we now have available uh, well that's a matter of having and as i think it was ingrid refer was referring having a, a very very strong thinking task force that will need to put together everything that has been produced, all the tools that are currently available, and with all them just building what would be a new approach to look at the same uh, and, and to give the same answers as animals are expected to give and are insufficiently giving, but that could even improve uh, what we have now in relation to the use of animals. So timelines, I'm not sure that we are able, but I'm sure that if we have a, a strong task force, putting together all the technology, the science, the new tools, the approaches that are there, I think that a couple of years, five, six years at, at least could be enough 
to bring the new paradigm well, well constructed that could leave then the, the, the food for uh, thoughts on how to overcome what at least is not needed when using animals. Many thanks, Beatrice. Um, I think it's interesting you, you highlighted the, the, the issue of need, there needing to be a paradigmatic shift um, in thinking and approaches. Um, before we move on to the next section, would anybody else on the panel or our, our two introductory speakers, is there anything you'd like to very briefly add? Helder, uh, I can see you wanted the yeah, floor. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Joe. I think some of these points uh, that have been made are really, really interesting. So thank you for your for your inputs. Uh, I was impressed by the by some of the uh, of the figures uh, provided by Kirsty on the the progress of, of the pharmaceutical industry. And um, I think this is a great uh, stepping stone for the successor, perhaps, of the Innovative Medicine Initiative, which would be the Innovative Health Initiative that is, that is currently in development. So I'm hoping uh, uh, that initiative can build on this. And I also really liked um, uh, in Professor Ingrid's um, um, principles as to how to go about this in terms of being integrative, inclusive, and adaptive. I think there was the three points. I think uh, this is exactly what this issue needs. I think it needs to be integrative because there's so many uh, director generals, agencies that can have an impact on this. It needs to be include, included in a, in, a, in a working group, in a, in a task force. It needs to be inclusive because so many stakeholders also can have an impact, uh, whether it's industry, NGOs, uh, academia, and adaptive. I think that the point of the action plan is to be able to um, to address multiple issues uh, in one um, in one plan. Uh, it's a lot less rigid than, than legislation. Uh, so I think um, uh, I think really that really fits with how we should uh, progress on this issue. That was my point. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Velda. Um, I saw a hand up from uh, one of our MEPs, uh, Michel Wiesik. Um, would you like to Would you like to intervene now, or do you want to wait to to, to the end? Uh, I, I'm afraid I got it wrong. I was going to ask question, but there's there's time for that probably okay. later. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Fine. Sorry. Sorry for that. No, no worries. No worries. Is there anybody else on the panel that would like to to, to add something this section uh, quickly before I move on? I see Louise. Like um, um, yeah, I would just like to add because I I, uh, I completely agree with elders uh, elders wrap up of this uh, of this point. Um, just to add uh, that another very important issue was how to tackle or rethink uh, the, the reduction. And I would say more even the replacement aspect that this is something that it's an issue that it's bigger than animal experiments. We're not only talking about the reduction on the number of animals to replace with methods that will do exactly the same, but we're talking about um, innovation in the way that we do science and that's something that I think in the next theme will be uh, broadened by, by, by our speakers. Okay, thank you. Um, Sirfa, I saw you waving. <laughs> Sirfa Peter Kine, one of our uh, MEPs. Um, please uh, take, take the floor, brief question. Well, uh, thank you for the discussion and actually I'm leaving the discussion, uh, the, the question for the uh, speakers to come as well. And that is, uh, what is actually the threshold that we do not uh, uh, move faster towards? Is it about uh, the approval mechanism about the alternative testing methodologies? Is this what the EU should focus? Is it the ECHAS role or is it the regulatory role? Or what is sort of uh, the, the thing that we should be nudging first? Who would like to, okay, uh, Ingrid, uh, if you'd like to give a quick response to that. Yeah, I can, I can, Thank you, Sia. I could start unpacking this question and I think it's all of the above. Uh, and I think the, the bottlenecks are, or the main bottlenecks are actually different for different applications. So we actually need to, in order to write a, a uh, an effective action plan, we need to do the work of looking at what are the bottlenecks. For different applications is it technological is it legislative is it societal is it paradigmatic 
uh, that's a difficult word to pronounce, is it in terms of, you know, societal values or paradigms? Um, uh, and I think for different applications, it's actually uh, different. And that's why I made the point of policy mixes, because we need to have action on all of those aspects in order to accelerate the transition. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Does anybody else want to just come in very briefly to answer Sierra's question before we move on to the next section? Yeah, yes, I mean, just, I just go oh, on. Let's have the sir, so please. No, 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 no I, I was saying if I could, um, well, um, as, as Ingrid said, this is um, maybe it's it's a mixture of everything. Uh, the regulatory component is 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 really important, but uh, the the difficulty here is that uh, up to now, these replacements and these discussions on replacements is 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 almost done. Uh, it's completely sliced. You find a new test, you ask for validation of that test, you request a, a, a regulatory acceptance of the test, and then there comes another one. So if you will have to do that for all organs in chips and all other type of in silico methods and so on, you, it will be a never ending story. So uh, in my view, and I insist with this, we need really to have an integrative, and here we have one on the eyes, uh, an integrative approach to think on an integrative approach. And maybe that's the integrative approach that will need then to be submitted for a regulatory acceptance. And this is a huge work, but it is a work that will put together uh, most of technologies, most of tools that are currently available, many of them human-based, in silico-based, uh, big data based and then small chips based just to 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 build a new building because we have now a very well established building and it will be very difficult to move from one to the other but someone has to think about a new one otherwise it will be a kind of a never ending story or very difficult story to to rebuild if we start refilling the, the existing paradigm with all the new methods and technologies and thinking, so it will become a monster. And then it, it's much less um, easy to, to address and, and to achieve what we want to achieve. Which by the end of the day, what is wanted to achieve is improvement of the outcomes. It's not just replacing animals, it's the improvement of the system, making it more efficient, more cost effective, and especially more, effect, more efficient. And I think that's an issue we're gonna get into in the next okay. section, um, relating to, to new technologies and, and funding. And, unless Helder, did you want to add something really, really quickly? No, that's fine. That was Okay, that was okay then we'll, we'll move on because we're actually running on time, which is quite remarkable. Um, right, thank you all for the thoughts of the, the, the issues relating to targets and uh, transition. Um, one of the, the other core ideas of the Parliament's resolution is to promote new technologies capable of replacing animal models by providing data that are more relevant to human biology than animals. Um, we've already heard uh, Beatrice uh, mentioned uh, organs on chips. Um, I'd like to, like to turn to, to our uh, fourth panellist who hasn't yet uh, spoken, uh, Thibault. Um, your company uh, manufactures and sells organs on chips. Can you briefly explain to the general public <laughs> that are joining us that aren't the experts here uh, what organs on chips actually are and why they are so often described as a game-changing uh, technology capable of better mimicking aspects of human biology than animals or simpler in vitro methods? Um, could you also give us um, a couple of examples of organs and chips being used right now um, that are already making a direct impact for human health in a way that couldn't have been achieved using animals? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Alder and the panelists for the invitation. I think it's a great opportunity here to get a direct insight on the real life industrial applications and the uh, difficulties we have. And I didn't intervene before because I guess we're going to have a Another insight of why there's a massive critical adaptability issue by the farmer industry. So to put it in a nutshell, uh, organ on chip are what we consider alternative methods um, regarding animal testing. In the sense that it's, uh, there are devices in which we can organize cells, human cells, uh, as in the same way as in the pathology of a human being. 
So basically, I like to say there are biological avatars, uh, let's say yet simplistic uh, avatars of, uh, of a pathology. And to be very pragmatic, as an example, I like to, to, to use our um, Parkinson on chip device that we, that, we, that we create. Parkinson disease is, not, is a very effective disease, uh, neurological troubles that has no cure. And don't get me wrong, we have cured uh, hundreds of times Parkinson in rodents, but never in human. There's no curative uh, treatments on rodents. Why? Because there's a lack of translationality between the brain of a rodent, even the brain of an animal, and the human brain. That's where we kick in. We actually have developed technologies that are able to position and to recreate a loop, a specific loop that is implicated in Parkinson's disease with human cells. Don't get me wrong, those are not uh, actual neurons. Those are induced pluripotent stem cells, you know, those famous stem cells that we gather from patients or from donors from biobanks that we differentiate in the different brain regions. So we recreate the loop that is implicated in Parkinson's disease with human cells. We duplicate that hundreds of times in tiny chips that actually I have here. So in this particular chips here, that is you recognize 96 well plate, the same format. We actually have uh, up to 16 uh, points in which we can test the efficiency of a drug, the safety of a drug to make a predictive model. So concretely, an organ and chip is a way to test a drug uh, much more in a relevant way than a basic Petri dish, but yet much more close to the human physiology. As an example, uh, I give you an example of how we use it, but today we have developed at Netri some building blocks to make echo of what you said before, in which you can assemble not even uh, neurological ways, but also different pathology as in, in, in also in a direct application for cosmetics, for pain and for nutrition. And uh, to give you an example of one of the pharma company that you work with, uh, that's wanted a, a chip that mimic pain. And it's very difficult to uh, assess and to quantify in a reproducible way pain in a rodent. It's very difficult to, make an, uh, to foresee how this anti-pain uh, treatment will act on the human. And on the regulatory basis, what they want is not to kill human and not to actually make the most efficient way. So what we've had, we developed a chip, a chip, a chip in which uh, we reproduce with human motor neuron and human sensory neurons uh, a, a pathological way of pain that can anticipate. And the direct application on animal welfare was that the pharma company did test at the beginning its drugs on, um, on animals, then switched to net trees and decided to stop the entire development because it didn't work in our chip. And if it didn't work, was working on human cells, it was not worth it to go further and to go into clinical trials. And this is the direct application uh, example of how your gun and chips can actually reduce for go no go decision, but also can avoid animal killing while trying to develop a drug that will fail inevitably in clinical trials applications. Sorry, <laughs> I'm muting myself. Thank you for that. Um, the, we uh, we were reading um, that there was just continuing on the issue of organs on chips. There was um, a breakthrough from a bunch of Israeli scientists recently who had developed a cancer drug without using any animal tests um, by using chips for the human kidney, liver and heart cells. Um, was this an isolated case or could we actually expect that organs on chips and other human-based methodology, methodologies uh, will take a bigger role in drug development during the next decade? Um, in my point of view, I think there's a momentum here that's going on. There's a real, um, taken of consciousness about the regulatory bodies that we can go fast and we can go good also. We can avoid uh, killing animals when, in which it's not relevant to, to work with. Uh, sorry about the background here, <laughs> noise. Um, so uh, in my point of view, there are a really um, consciousness momentum by the pharma company that they can use those innovative tools to go make faster decision and in in inevitably to um, um, save money also, which is down to the bottom. It's what they want also apart from developing drugs. So I think the, the, there's a real need to push um, this kind of approach into particular uh, indication. And, and, and Beatrice said that we cannot develop everything at the same time. We have to be focused and we will talk about it later, but I'm pretty sure that we can push that into clinical trials or, or preclinical trials. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to shift now to, to Beatrice on this. Um, from, from your experience with concrete cases where drugs were approved without the usual battery of uh, safety and efficacy tests on animals, can you briefly share um, some of those case studies with us and your views on how they could possibly inspire a more general approach to drug testing with limited or no use for animals? H how do you see these kind of new te technologies that Thibault has just uh, described and also big data um, aiding the replacement of animals and disease research in uh, um, regulatory testing? You're on mute still. Sorry, there are, there are unfortunately not so many cases because every time there is a possibility to get an animal testing, even for comfort reasons, uh, usually they always show up. But anyway, um, um, in, 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 in a specific components, there are examples and there are interesting examples where um, in the animal free or non animal um strategies have been very useful and uh, used uh, to address specific points especially when animals were so um, um un unuseful for this so that the company had to do something different um one aspect not exactly that one related to this one but i think that it touched me a lot is related to one of the drugs that have been uh, approved uh, recently uh, for cystic fibrosis, uh, where the company it was not uh, it was not the animal uh, it was not the 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 classical preclinical testing on uh, uh, safety that has been replaced, but it was the basis for efficacy checking that was uh, done using um, um, in vitro test systems. Uh, some of them were um, human bronchial cells, where, so this is about uh, Eva Kaftor, Teza Kaftor, uh, where the, the, the effect and the potential for the drug to correct the, the, the chloride channel and to make, to allow the, the currents of uh, chloride to be restored and so on, have been checked in vitro. And the idea of the company was to um, identify the mutation uh, that was behind the dysfunction that led to the cystic fibrosis in that patient, so personally, and then uh, to check if the drug would or not be able to restore in cells that were transfected with that mutation, the, so the normal currents of chloride. So in a nutshell, it was more or less like this. And what they have proposed was that if the product, uh, if there was this um, uh, effect seen in vitro, and this could be done even for uh, testing, um, the, for testing uh, personalized mutations, where so sometimes we know this is a disease where uh, sometimes they are very, very rare. So it's not possible even to, to put a nut uh, shell of the patients to check for clinical trial then the indication could be expanded to these mutations where in vitro the drug had shown uh, efficacy. And this, this in vitro was in a, syst a test system that uh, regulators in Europe, for instance, liked less, but regulators in the US accepted because they were transfecting the, the, the cells which were not human cells. But at the same time, there were other intestinal organoids from humans or uh, epithelial cells from humans that could be tested also. And this was for proof of effect, proof of concept, and then to impact on the indication. And this is very important. Another example is related to a biodistribution study conducted for one of these CAR T cells, one of the first ones with the, with the Novartis, where for the biodistribution, what the company has been done, uh, because it was difficult to get all this information in, in human, was to check for the interaction with human tissues and then checking whether the CAR T cells that were supposed to tackle just a certain uh, target in the tumor would or not be uh, interacting and binding to other healthy human tissues. So these are two good examples because the, 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 the last one could be an animal, an animal testing. And it was more 
a, a kind of a think-based approach, the like risk-based approach. There is a risk that these CAR T cells, when committed, would go and bind to tissues which are not supposed to bind and then lead to immune responses or destructive and responses and effects. And the company then was checking that in human cells. And this is the type of approaches that could be really expanded and started to be thought and could replace really animals. Thank you for those really good examples. And you also raised an interesting point about the difference in the EU and the US, for example, which we'll get back to later. Um, uh, Kirsty, uh, question for you now. Um, in the light of what we've just heard, um, do you think that an EU action plan could support uh, these new innovative technologies, their development over that of using animals. And what, what do you think that the role of uh, Horizon Europe, the, the uh, EU research uh, plan that's funded by the EU budget, um, what kind of role should it play in this regard? A quick answer, because I see we're now, uh, now running a bit late. <laughs> I'll do my best, Chair. Um, just to say that um, from, from the farmer perspective, I mean, these microphysiological or organ on a chip or the 3D models and organoids are rapidly evolving as promising in vitro tools to recapulate the human uh, physiology. So they definitely have a, a place to play. Um, at the moment, they're not able to fully replicate the uh, complexity of the different um, reactions of a living organism. However, with a certain development and with the speed that and bringing the scientists together, I believe that, you know, it's, it's definitely a good progress to be made. And just so you ask, um, what can be done? Uh, just thinking about it. So, so much is happening, uh, sometimes in silos, and this has been brought up already. And therefore, a coordinated approach is definitely very important. Um, we must find ways to bring the different developments and their different stages together. And I think the EU funded frame programs definitely offer this opportunity. Um, the Commission had funded 800 million uh, towards alternatives under previous uh, uh, framework programs, and therefore the expectation is that they will continue to do so, and hopefully they can identify the really the relevant funding opportunities that will really bring about the change, and also where we need it under research in both uh, toxicity testing. And furthermore, as has been said, I, I believe it's essential to build confidence in the methods and also establish feasibility in the scale up of the industrial setting. For example, um, I would like to see the agencies and the regulators having more confidence in accepting the new methods also, both in Europe and, and internationally. So therefore the need for the global um, acceptance. And then just referring back to what um, Helder had brought up earlier, I, I see as an opportunity in the health sector that um, through the next generation of projects that will be part of the Innovative Health Initiative. So this is the new proposed um, health public-private partnership under Horizon Europe, and it should kick off early 2022. And as we transition from the Innovative Medicines Initiative to the new um, Innovative Health Partnership under Horizon Europe, the pharma and the medtech um, industries, because now medtech will be part of of the collaboration, are committed to continue to invest in the collaborative research initiatives and to projects to improve the animal uh, welfare, three hours, and also to uh, support startups uh, with expertise in, in new approaches, um, like, like we have with um, Thibault being part of today's um, discussion. Thank you, Kirsty. Moving to Thibault, um, would you agree with what Kirsty has had to say, and, and in your opinion, as the CEO of a of a startup, of an innovative uh, SME like yours, um, do you think it should be a priority to help SMEs developing these disruptive technologies like yours? Um, a quick response, please. Sure, yeah, obviously, um, I totally agree with, with Christy about funding, but more than that, I think there's a really uh, necessary to uh, place different stakeholders around the table. Stakeholders being the pharma company, on that which definitely buy and give all the validation criteria that they expect from us. So we need co-construction uh, with them to build the proper scientific proof that they, will, that they will comply with, but also with regulatory bodies that will tell us, yes, indeed, if you provide this amount of proof, we will consider those alternative methods into preclinical trials. So apart from more than funding, I think um, uh, aspects like Christy presented, but also the innovative task force that has been uh, created recently need to place uh, both um, 
the, 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 end, the end users, the regulated bodies, but also the development of innovative technologies that we need insights to make the proper roadmap of our own development. That's where design thinking needs to be at the core of the, of the validation process. Uh, and also with all the industrial, industrial challenges that we face on reproducibility and reproducibility of those, uh, of those models. Many thanks, Tibor. That was very, very clear. Um, just to conclude this, this, this section, I'm going to turn to Ingrid again. Um, from what you've heard so far and from your research into transformative uh, governance, um, for an EU action plan to be successful, what elements uh, could you very briefly identify as being crucial to promoting a new way of doing science? And where do disruptive technologies play an important role and how can they actually become mainstream? Probably a bit much to ask in two minutes, but <laughs> please try. I'll give it a try. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think I uh, concur with a lot of uh, what has been said already. I mean, Beatrice talked about the paradigm shift. Uh, I do think we need new paradigms. Uh, the current paradigm of animal testing being the gold standard is outdated. It's old fashioned 20th century science. We need to move on. Uh, as other speakers have said, uh, there is problems of translatability from animals to humans. Uh, so the current system is actually not as effectively protecting human health and the environment as some might think. So we actually need also from an efficacy uh, argument, we need new science in order to uh, reach these uh, societal goals. So we shouldn't only aim to replace animal models, but we should actually invest in human relevant science as the other speakers have also said. So it's a change of paradigm to make science not only more ethical, but also more effective. What I think we also need, and uh, I think Thibault uh, also talked about this, is that the transition, so while we're transitioning to this, uh, to this new uh, human-focused science, uh, we also need a different way of organizing things. So uh, we need, uh, I hear from, from many scientists and companies that animal testing is sometimes done just in case for legislative approval because the system is still stuck in, in the old science while companies and, and, and scientists are moving on. So uh, the action plan, and I agree with Tibolt, should the action plan should include collaborative action between these different stakeholders. Uh, so that both industry, academia, and legislative authorities, so they, they can together, or we can together, redesign animal-free legal approval processes. And maybe uh, a comment that I haven't heard yet is that including academic journals may actually also be an important aspect because they often ask, as I hear from my uh, medical science colleagues, they often ask for animal experiments while uh, the science has moved on. I also think that we need short timelines for phasing out animal testing for different applications in order to stimulate innovation. Beatrice uh, said that she struggled with, uh, with these timelines. Maybe we actually need movable timelines in, in, in case uh, timelines are, are, um, are that, that the speed of innovation goes quicker than the timelines we set. So maybe we actually need uh, I don't know whether it's legally possible, but uh, to have adaptable uh, timelines to actually catch up and uh, to stay on top of innovation. Um, and obviously not only investment in, uh, in animal free innovation, but also its application. So the problem is not always technical, but it's also legal and social. So uh, um, uh, just only investing in technological innovation will not, will not uh, get us there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I guess the idea of having flexible uh, timelines, uh, I'm not sure what the Commission would, uh, would, would, would make of that. Um, for me, accountability um, is, is probably a, a, a one of the main ingredients when setting any timelines. But um, let's move on now just to a different uh, topic. That's um, education and, and regulations. Um, that's another thing that came up in the, in the Parliament's resolution. Um, Beatrice, um, education in non-animal methods is one of the things that could accelerate the replacement of animals in, in research. I mean, there's no point in having the most advanced technologies in the world if very few people actually know how to use them. Um, as someone that's working in, in academics, uh, in, uh, as an academic in higher education, what do you think that the EU could do to foster the knowledge and, and use and, and yeah and, and foster the use of 
new advanced non-animal methods in academic research? Well, I think that there has been, uh, there, there is a lot being done and non-animal research based on in vitro testing, cell culturing, um, uh, even uh, more sophisticated uh, three, three dimensional 3D uh, constructs and uh, for some more wealthy, the, the, the chips, the, the organ in chips uh, technology. So I think they are all there and uh, academia likes a lot to do that. Uh, what I see and I hear from my colleagues is that there is a difficulty they face very often, which is when they get their results and they get their results and try to make their uh, conclusions uh, translatable to human, uh, they very often are requested even by the referees from their journals uh, that animal testing should be needed and animal experimentation to confirm their results should be uh, uh, conducted. And I think this is a, a kind of a aspect that is, uh, is, is really needed uh, to be changed. It could be the other way around. So it might be that uh, um, information that would be solid and not needed to be funded, to be uh, supported by animal uh, results would be uh, much more uh, important. Um, the use of human-based uh, um, human based systems uh, should be encouraged. And to have these human-based systems being encouraged, I think it's a matter of money. I see that, uh, well, uh, animal experimentation, exception for animal models of disease and so on, are less expensive uh, than um, uh, if, if you go to high technology based uh, experimentation. Uh, I think that regulate um, uh, researchers need uh, to have a cheaper access to uh, cell banks, to even to the technology, to organs in chips and so on. They might need some support for their uh, research uh, with these uh, uh, technologies. And something that makes me a bit nervous normally is when I see uh, some of these systems being produced in the lab, in-house, just to enable the, to enable the research. Because uh, this means that they might not be of sufficient quality to be translated to other labs. And then it would need another level of uh, activity to somehow qualify, uh, qualify them. So I think, to be honest, that academics are very open to work without animals, but they should not be pushed, uh, especially by journals, to make this. And one aspect that is important in terms of education is to push them to try to get more human sampling. So this means better contact with hospitals and so on for, um, for the sampling for the uh, human-based uh, material that will allow them with the geomics, with the, uh, then to take uh, the profit and to get proof of concepts without going to animals and generating these very incredible animal models of disease that by the end of the day uh, do not mimic sufficiently uh, human diseases. Many thanks for that. Uh, those are really excellent suggestions. And it's, it's quite shocking, really, to realize that academic journals are forcing animal tests to take place when we're trying to trap animal research. It's, it's, it's yeah, that's really standing yeah, in the way of, they, they need to engage in that paradigmatic shift. Yeah. Um, um, let me just move back to, to, to Thibaut. Um, organs on chips that we've, we've uh, already seen have a uh, enormous potential for health research, but they also represent a rapidly growing market sector. Do you think that um, Europe can become a leader in this market or should we be concerned? Uh, as I think uh, Beatrice also uh, raised the issue of that the US will beat us to it, um, as has happened before with other uh, technologies. Um, what could an action plan actually do for Europe to take a strong position in the sector and ensure that SMEs such as your own have a favorable regulatory environment so that their products can be used safely by pharmaceutical or chemical country, uh, companies. Yeah, I think uh, what uh, Professor Silva Lima uh, really raised uh, a very focused point. Um, there's, a, there's a capital need to eventualize uh, the, the, the use of alternative methods, including organic chips with the pharma company. So definitely education of the capability of those uh, 
uh, of what we can extract from those models. It's it's still a model. Uh, can we need to show that to the to the to the formula company? The power of them, and especially as an example with the all the neurological troubles, where there's where there's need. To, <laughs> sorry, to have both the, the the structure of the connectivity, but also the function how the neurons communicate. And we cannot do that in vitro. And definitely, we don't have the resolution in vivo. So this is the the power of uh, what we can make with such organonship. That being said. Um, there's a real bottleneck, and indeed, and I'm very, very sorry to say that U.S. has already been, have a, an advance on us, where they have uh, two, year, two years back created this innovative task force uh, that placed, uh, the FDA placed uh, uh, stakeholders around the table to, to, to actually uh, push into the Modernization Act. So yes, we need, there's an urgent moment to move. And again, thank you for all what you are pushing, but le legislative body needs to take account that we have a lot of power in Europe. So you have a lot of pharma company. We have a lot of, of amazing technologies, including what we can have from academia. And there's a, a, an urgent matter to make all those stakeholders around the table. Just, give me, just let me give you an example also about Biobex. And this is where the legislature can really make a, a tremendous effort. We know that when culturing organs, organoids on chip or organ on chip, that it depends on the reproducibility of how can we access the data. And if the same donor or the same source can, be, can have a completely different fate if it's done in Strasbourg, in, in, in Munich, or in another, uh, because there's a lack of reproducibility. So there's two terms in what I want to say. The first one is that there's a need to enhance and to create bio, European biobanks. And I think this is critical. Today, my clients want me to buy um, um, cells from providers that are outside Europe, rather than using cells that are even more relevant, even more reproducible than from uh, academic partnerships, because uh, we ha don't have the capacity to at least explore um, uh, biobanking from donors that are willing, that are willing to give their cells. You know what? I got tens of, of, of uh, patients from Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease that call us today. We want to help. We don't have the capacity to do that. So. Our uh, GDPR, it's, it's, it's really important, don't get me wrong, but we need at least to go into the research for the private sector to get access to those kind of massive biobanks compared to at least the US, first. Second, and this will be my, my, my last point, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll be quick. There's, a, there's a, a, a really urgent need to create some norms. And this is where uh, the regulatory body can come in and kick in to actually create some pathway into think globally from the inception of the, de of the device of the automated network to the end point, which is the end users. And again, we need to think about the supply chain from the inception where we can place all the validation process to create norms on how those organ chips are designed, are fabricated, and reproducibility of fabrication is critical. And we are facing this challenge every day at Netry, where we need to have massive industrialization, quality control, I insist quality control of both fabrication process but also quality control of cell culture. And this is where we're gonna win. But we need to settle all the table and this is by norms and by bow banks. Sorry for being long. No, thank you to Beau. And, and I think that uh, I'm hoping that the, the MEPs on this call, on this uh, webinar are listening because I can actually see some actions for them to take with regard to, to stimulating uh, biobanks in Europe, for example. Um, Kirsty, just moving to you really quickly. Um, what are FPI's uh, members' views regarding the, the uh, regulations to ensure the safety and efficacy of new drugs and uh, therapies? Do you, can you outline very quickly uh, your vision of how these regulations could better implement the use of non-animal methods? Ken, yeah, thanks, Joe. I just want to go back to what Thibault was saying, because I'm writing down here something I, I seem to write quite often, and that's that we did decision makers in Europe to be more focused on innovation. We need to bring innovation back. And that's something we talk about quite often um, within FPA. And this is specifically if we want to see a European uh, strategic autonomy um, in, the, in the near future, as we talk about um, quite often within the EU institutions. Now, I just want to put into context quickly um, uh, how it is with medicine. So with medicines developers, um, we're required to demonstrate the potential and new commercialized uh, medicines and therapeutics and vaccines are safe. Um, and effective in humans and in animals in the case of vets. And so we rely, and I just want to bring this to the point, we rely heavily on technologies to support our research 
and testing programs, which include in vitro assays, in silico methods, new innovative technologies, existing patient data. And at a late stage, we do use animals in this preclinical development. So while we move towards uh, more relevant methodologies, we must also not forget that animals um, can be the subject also of the study themselves, like um, vaccines for pets and um, the effect of the pollutants on water, um, on fish, for example. And also I saw recently in a documentary, the, the cows that are placed on various dietary substances to help decrease the, the methane production, for example. So looking at animal testing, we have to realize it's looking across the veterinary and the human side. Uh, there's, it's also about having tests that are relevant for the species that's being tested. Um, you asked me specifically on the regulatory aspects. Now, looking at the, the European Medicines um, Agency, for example, see we have some colleagues online, so I hope I get this right. But, you know, they do have guidance at the moment um, that applies to human and veterinary um, medicines and regulatory acceptance on the three hour testing approaches. And um, this document outlines the various processes for submission and an evaluation of the proposals for regulatory acceptance. So this is very, this is very important. And I think what we need to see is that with the uptake of the science is really much aligned with the uptake in, at the regulatory level, because usually that's where the imbalance is. It's a bit, it's a bit, slow, but um, it was great to see recently the EMA did announce that they're putting in place special support to medicines developers to replace, reduce, and refine animal use. And by, uh, for the development, manufacturing, and testing of human and veterinary medicines. And this is worked through their innovative um, task force. And the planned action will facilitate the development and implementation of these new approach methodologies, which we've been discussing today. Uh, quickly, I also wanted to note that um, within the pharma sector, we have the European uh, Directorate for Quality of Medicines and Healthcare. And they have active taking um, new uh, in vitro three-hour methods. And I'd recommend not to go into any details now, but I'd recommend participants um, on this call today do go and look at their webpage because they give a detailed outline of since 2013, they highlight the various activities that they've taken in place to improve their monographs. So that's um, the, the monographs determine um, where we can um, use certain methods. And these yearly reviews um, have seen the uptake of in vitro methods for a number of human and animal vaccines, both for um, regulatory acceptance and also of redundant animal methods. So that's very important. So, okay, thank um, you. yeah. And sorry, I, I need to cut you off no. because we, we, we're, we're running uh, quite late. I just wanted to give one, uh, one other panelist the floor uh, very, uh, very briefly before we, we move to the section where. I want some summing up, but also uh, some, to be able to take some questions from, from our MEPs. Um, Ingrid, very quickly, um, laws are an important element of change. Um, do you think it's most important to enable the adaptation of laws and curricula to empower a transition to non-animal science, just uh, in, in, in a nutshell? Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. And I, uh, I'm gonna, um, uh, reflect on this uh, section from a very different angle than the previous speakers, I think. Um, and going back to values and paradigms and, and goals again as part of the discussion on transformative change. So to me, it's very clear that uh, societal values on human non-human relationships are changing. You don't only see it in the current debate, but, but also uh, uh, the discussions on ecocide, rights of nature, animal rights, you see all of those debates taking place around the world. And it's only a matter of time that these will actually be reflected in law. Uh, so I would say that the current resolution and discussion on uh, accelerating the transition to animal free innovation is actually part of these larger trends. Um, I do want to reflect on Christie's uh, 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 contribution just now, because I do want to reiterate the point that I made in the beginning, that some of the current uses of animal science will hopefully become redundant in the future if we actually go through this transformative change of changing our diets, changing our agricultural practices, changing our industrial practices, uh, and changing our uh, health uh, system. So I cannot uh, stress enough that uh, these fundamental societal and transformative changes of the way we design our economies and societies are a vital contribution to uh, lowering the need for animal science in the first place. 
I do want to make one more point on education, and I, I see lots of um, um, uh, positive uh, examples around the world, but I think in education, I think one of the main bottlenecks is when education meets uh, research. So a lot of master students and a lot of PhD students are actually uh, required either formally or informally to use uh, animal uh, science in their, in their uh, studies. And I think that's, again, they meet uh, scientists that are still part of the old system while they are developing the new system. And I think this is a bottleneck in the, in the transition uh, where uh, we do need to, uh, that also needs attention in the action plan. I'll leave it with that for now because I know you were okay. asking me to stop. <laughs> Yeah, I'm getting stressed out with time here. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, um, I'd like to kind of wrap up the, 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 the panel part discussion now just by asking each of the panelists um, to give me a kind of elevator statement, so like 30 second uh, soundbite on what steps the commission can take to ensure that the action plan really delivers uh, significant uh, reductions of animal use, uh, improves health research, and also will generate some kind of economic benefit. And also in the meantime, all the MEPs that would like to ask a question, could you just wave at me so I know that, uh, that you uh, want a question? Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, uh, let's start first with Thibaut uh, answering this question. Elevator statement from you. Okay, so to put it in a nutshell, uh, from my point, there's two big plan of action, three big plan of action to make. The first one is to be as autonomous as possible compared to what is going on out there. Uh, by uh, thinking really about uh, freeing all the biobanking and the donorship, uh, into the, the own philosophy of Europe, but also to liberate when donors, uh, genetic donors, but also voluntary donors can give uh, their cells, not only to public system, but to public private bodies. So the way to give this possibility, the second big thing is to create norms and to create task force in which people, stakeholders will be around the table to make the pipe of innovation continuous while maintaining regulation that can still be in line and in focus with what was is uh, going on on the market and not only a simple uh, de de uh, demand and supply where SMEs are really under the under the crowd and they cannot work with uh, with big pharma companies. So ITF and norms will be the great idea of a plan of the actual plan. Okay, that was a very long elevator ride, Beatrice. <laughs> your turn. I would split. I would split because this is about uh, looking at efficacy. This is about looking at safety, and I would suggest that. Uh, uh, a lot of work should be the um, uh, initiative and stress to be put on the use of human-based material rather than animal models for human situations. And this is about efficacy. And with regard to safety, I would suggest that the risk-based approach already implemented and settled for specific therapies be considered seriously for everything and then with risk-based approach, integrating in silico, in vitro, and knowledge in general, uh, human-based could lead to a uh, reduction if not. That. So animals will become the exception, not the rule. Thank you. Kirsty. Okay, so it's, <laughs> it's clear from today that um, the discussions that animal research and testing poses obvious moral problems and concerns. Uh, however, I believe it's also important that decisions and the way we move forward on any action plan should be science and evidence based. So decisions to minimize any animal use in any of the industry sectors needs to be based on a proper risk benefit, as has been mentioned by Beatrix. And this needs to be taken into account when, when developing any, any discussions. Of, um, I also believe very much, sorry, just to say quickly, enhanced um, regulatory dialogue, continued um, communication with all the players is very important to ensure that we have improved um, regulatory systems and regulatory ex acceptance. And we must make sure that all policies that are adopted, even with good intentions, that we do not create any vul vulnerabilities in the system. And just to say quickly, FPM members are committed to a science-based phase in of the methods to replace the use of animals for scientific purposes and the deletion of animal tests, which are obsolete or redundant. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Ingrid, your last word. Yeah, thanks so much. So um, 
I would take a step back and start with the societal goals. So for, I think in essence, our societal goals are human and animal health and well-being and environmental sustainability. And then how to reach those goals is the main question through transformative change that will not only en uh, enable reaching those broader societal goals, but will also tremendously lower the need for animal science. Um, so this need to link uh, our current discussion to other policy areas is, is one of the keys. One other point I need to make is we shouldn't be afraid for conflict. Um, even more strongly formulated, consensus-based processes will not get us there. Actors representing the old-fashioned economy and science will try to halt or slow down the transition that's just part of the process. There are stacks and stacks of social scientific literature describing that and actually predicting it. So, uh, of course, we need to provide them opportunities to change their careers, to become part of the transition, but there will be uh, conflict, and that's fine. That's uh, as, as in any fundamental societal change, there will be conflict and that's okay. One more important point that I haven't heard yet, we need to avoid new legislation uh, that will uh, ask for uh, new animal testing. The easiest part of an action plan is to avoid new legislation asking for uh, new animal testing. That's like the low hanging fruit. I would plea for a moratorium on new legislation that asks for, uh, for animal testing while we get this transition on the road. And we need international cooperation, as, uh, as uh, others have said, we can learn from, uh, from actions elsewhere, but we also need to move the transition beyond the European Union. Okay, many thanks, Ingrid, and, and also to the rest of the panelists. I'm gonna open the floor now to, to, to the MEPs. Uh, Michal uh, Wiesek, you had your hand up earlier, so I'm gonna to go to you first. Um, oh. Um, also, maybe point out if people can also direct uh, their question, maybe at a specific uh, panelist, uh, just for efficiency. All right, thank you, Yo, for the floor, and big thank to all the speakers for uh, in this event. It was really, really brilliant to listen to them. I have two questions actually. One goes on education and training, which already has been touched by uh, both of our professors. But, but again, I, I really got the idea that the. the there is something something rotten in, in the process of the education and uh, training on advanced non-animal models, which may not uh, be as advanced and integrated in the EU-wide undergraduate and postgraduate curricula compared to all the models, including the ones that use animals. So maybe maybe to shed more details from your own perspectives or experience, uh, do you believe that scientists are really adequately trained to use innovative non-animal approaches? And if not, uh, is the lack of training and knowledge uh, generating unnecessary animal experiments. And my second question uh, goes directly to the FBI. Uh, while we were working on the motion of resolution, um, we noticed that the uh, corpus of knowledge towards animal models uncertainties for human relevance was uh, never properly uh, tackled uh, in the EU compared to, for instance, USA, where there is an ongoing review. So my question is, would uh, FPI support uh, this or such activity uh, in the European Union? Thank you very much. Okay, maybe I can just take the other two questions and then um, then the panelists can respond to them. Maybe that's going to be a bit more efficient. Um, Tilly, maybe uh, you can ask next. Thank you very much for giving me the floor and uh, indeed thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation and discussion that we had already here. Um, I try to be very short I, because indeed I have three questions but I make it very short. Um, knowing that uh, the main use of animals in research is done in basic research, um, how can we really, uh, and not in applied research, how, could, how do you think we could really reduce the use of animal in basic research? That's my first question. And then that is very general to, to all of you. And then more specifically, specifically to Kirsty from FPA, um, I've heard that Adrian wrote from Roche in a recent working shop said, 
that innovation curve is flattening in pharma. Moreover, he also admitted that a certain pressure always helped to move towards new methods. And he also said, for example, that there is no treatment for cancer immunotherapy. So since Roche is one of the FPR board member, can you please comment his statement and whether his position is really reflected among the other FPA, FPR members? So really the importance of replacement and not only refinement and reduction. And then, as I understand well, Professor Beatrice Silva Lima, a lot of things she said I really liked also. Um, but she's, as I understood well, she said we don't need to have, or it's not good to have a, a timeline. But I'm not sure if I understand that well. So it's more that uh, to come back to that point, no timeline. And, and also, a little bit Ingrid was saying it uh, we need a flexible timeline. I'm personally, I'm I believe more that we need timeline. Otherwise, it's it's uh, never going on postponing. Otherwise, we're never going to achieve the change of paradigm. And also the need, and it was mentioned by many of you, the need to work together on an integrative, holistic approach for this action plan. Uh, and also we got some interesting input here that we need more human samplings for, uh, samplings, for example. I found it very interesting and the need of a concrete task force. And then my last one is more a wish and I'm finishing on that. I hope that all of you, I know the FPA is member of the EPAA, but I'm not sure that the other experts that we heard today, a member of the EPAA, which is really a table with all the stakeholders to find solutions. So it's really cool. Please, if you're not member there, get active there, because I think you can bring great input there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tilly. Uh, Francisco, um, your question, please. Uh, your question, please. Hello, thank you very quick. Uh, probably will be will be for Thibault Oniger. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced the name. Uh, it's very, very, I think you'll be the one to, to answer this. Uh, we all know that for companies, uh, well, carrying out tests on animals um, to meet regulatory requirements can be costly, obviously, and time consuming. So my question would be, how do you think non-animal approaches uh, can save costs to companies using them? And do you think that, like, public-private partnerships can help uh, accelerate this uh, innovation. This is for you, but if anyone also would like to comment, uh, it would be very interesting to know the position. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, who would like to start with responding to those questions? And can I, can I just ask everybody uh, right now whether it's okay if we run on for about five minutes or so? Yeah, okay, I'm seeing nods. Okay, great. Uh, Kirsty. Most of the questions were directed to me, so I'm going to try and cover what I can. Um, there was a mention across to a review of animal models in the USA, so I'm just trying to put it in perspective, so I don't know specifically what the MEP was referring to. If you're referring to the, the 2035 deadline of funding um, that's in the US, um, just for for mammals, then I can respond to that. I I have open questions there, really, because I do know within Europe and within our countries, they have set strategies to decrease and to 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 phase out um, of in the the non-animal methods um, by seventy five percent for certain things, for example. But that's really based on the science and looking at where they can replace, refine, and reduce um, on those specific issues, for example, biologicals. But in the USA, and I'm, I don't have clarity on this, I know that they've indicated 4.5 million going to research of alternatives when we're talking in Europe about, um, you know, over a billion that's gone toward um, funding of alternatives. So I, that's where, where I get a bit confused with the correlation. When it, they talk about phase out of mammals, my question has always been, I know in the USA, they do not consider in their animal fair law um, regulations. They do not consider rats, mice, and, and well, birds are not mammals, but so are these parts of their phase out, for example? I, I'd like to have clarity on that. It would be good to have had someone from, from the US to, to answer that question. So I don't know if they take that into account, but um, within Europe, of course, we do. We cover all um, uh, vertebrate species and some invertebrate species. So, so we do have that within our directive 2010-63, which is seen as a replacement um, then the, the reference across to Adrian Roth, 
I do know who he is. He's very involved with the, um, the work on the uh, microphysiological systems. Um, I haven't seen his comments that has been, have been made. Um, I do know that we are increasing in research and innovation, but we do feel that from the political side in Europe, there's a move away from the real emphasis on, on innovation. In Europe, we would like to see that there is a lot more. I have seen papers from him re very recently speaking on the benefits coming from the microphysiological systems, but I am, um, he's spoken out in the fact that, you know, they cannot replicate yet the, the entirety of an organ. So I, I think, um, yeah, I cannot respond specifically to what he has said or what he, his company has responded to, but uh, that I do know that there is a lot of um, analysis and investigation underway. On the non-animal approaches and, and par public-private partnerships, what has happened, um, one in particular I'd like to bring up, um, there's a project called Premier, and I bring this up because of Ingrid being online. Um, there was a project kicked off last, last year, it looks at um, environmental risk assessment. Now the expectation from the, the um, decision makers will probably be that we have to do legacy testing on active pharmaceutical ingredients. Now that would mean thousands and thousands and thousands of animal tests. Now what we have, we've set up this project under the IMI, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, and one of the packages is looking at in silica and in vitro methods to really make sure that when we do have to come forward with these, the tests and that to, to carry out the environmental risk assessment, that we do not have to carry them out on animals. So, so there is a lot underway within public-private partnerships, moving away from, from the animal testing and implementing these, these non-animal approaches. Okay, thank you, Kirsty. Uh, Thibault, uh, would you like to respond to the question that was specifically directed at you? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And I have to run in five minutes. Um, to, to put it in a nutshell, um, I think, don't get me wrong, but there's something that needs to, to relatively to the timeline, we will not, just to keep focus, we will not be able to replace animals, replace animals, and, and animal testing needs to be still maintained for a while to make a, a mentality evolve. And as uh, Kirsty said, organo chips, at least I'm talking about what I know, organo chips are sim simple models, simplistic models, minimalistic models. We will never be able to replace a full body on a chip for decades. I think we need just to be realistic here. Uh, we can, uh, yes, we can replace and we can, re we can, sorry, we can uh, refine, we can lower the number of animals that is testing. But I mean, for now, we need to be pragmatic. Uh, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the knowledge also to re completely replace. So there's, needs, there's a need of a timeline. This needs to be pragmatic also. Uh, and, and in this matter, I think that academia has a real uh, fo focus here to, to play with because they have the knowledge to validate uh, the biological relevance and probably the, the, the translationality towards clinical trials also to make the, 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 the translation, the report between what has been done and, and what, what could have been foreseen with organochip to make predictive models. And this is where I think public, public private partnerships can be really relevant. Uh, and there's a lot of funding in this area, but we need to push it. And I, re, and I rejoin Christy, Christy in, the, in this matter that we need to push public private uh, partnership to make proper validation because they know how to make and they are they are the best to make clinical trials and to foresee and we should make parallel between clinical trials but also organic chip uh, uh, predictive models ass assessment. Finally, there was a question about how can pharma save money, and this is really critical in the path that if we have a, a sufficient relevant model for go no go process decision, they will switch uh, really more rapidly and they will they will save money in this matter. Uh, rather than uh, killing thousands of animals uh, and, and finally decide to, 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 play, to, to cut off. So I'm pretty much convinced that with a yet relevant model, yet, yet a minimalistic model, we can have sufficient element of toxicology assays, whether we have a kidney, a, a liver, and an, another organ on chip, we could have at least predicting model that if, it, it, if it's not working, we'll be able not to move forward and we can save money. We can also make uh, drug repositioning since drugs have been on, on, the, on the market, we know that they don't have tox effect. We can, with relevant model, in a quick and easy manner, without animal testing, or at least while limiting animal testing, working with also CROs, we can also um, uh, um, move, see how a drug can be repositioned in an easy and fast way on a different indication. Hopefully I, I've done all the questions. Thank you so much, Thibault. Um, 
I'm, we're going to have to wrap this up now. Um, we've had a number of questions also from the public, uh, from the audience. Um, a number of them have, I can see, already, according to my, my colleagues, have already been answered during the course of the, the, the conversation. The ones that have remained unanswered, um, we'll try and ask uh, our, our panelists and, and our two presenters if they can take a look at them and, and uh, circle back to the people that have uh, posed those questions, if that's okay. Um, thank you so much all for participating in this very informative discussion. Um, I'm now going to hand the floor back to Anya Hajikamp to close this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and thank you uh, so much to everyone uh, for your contributions. They were uh, very valuable and, and interesting. Um, we heard so many things today that it is very difficult to summarize, but I, I will try. Uh, we heard that an action plan to uh, transition to animal-free innovation needs to consider a holistic vision uh, of the problems that we are trying to solve through research, regulation, and education. Um, and we are not working in the dark. There are concrete case studies that can be looked at to inform concrete actions and uh, uh, objectives. Um, but still a lot of questions uh, remain. Uh, uh, for example, can we significantly reduce the use of animals uh, for drug testing with the solutions that we have today? Uh, to achieve uh, concrete and absolute reductions, we need to select areas of use and uh, plan case um, uh, plan case-based uh, reductions. One solution does not fit all. Human-based advanced, uh, advanced technologies, including biobanks, can reshape research on human diseases uh, and improve at the same time uh, uh, and accelerate treatments. But strengthening preventive healthcare could also have an enormous impact. Ensuring a constant uh, evolution of educational curricula uh, to uh, maintain students, researchers, and other groups uh, updated on the new non-animal models is a challenge that requires a high level of coordination. And coordination and collaboration between the European Commission, member states, and all stakeholders involved are key for a successful action, uh, action plan to phase out the use of animals in science. And to finalize, uh, we heard also that we don't need to be afraid of conflict. Uh, conflict is okay and consensus-based policies will not get us there. Um, the intergroup will uh, request a meeting with the um, uh, European Commission to share uh, the conclusions of this meeting and also discuss views on the Parliament's call for an action plan to transition to non-animal science. And we hope that this will be the beginning of a fruitful dialogue that will lead to concrete actions that will um, effectively replace the use of animals in our laboratories. Again, thank you everyone for joining this important event on the acceleration of non-animal um, uh, innovations. And I hope to see you all again soon. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.